I'd like you to take charge, Poirot. I am happy to oblige you, my friend. Eh bien, mesdames et messieurs, we are gathered here to learn the facts behind the death of Arlena Marshall. Mrs. Castle, our hostess, will not be joining us. She has fled the island, carefully shadowed by the police. Good God, ma'am. Do you mean to say she murdered Mrs. Marshall? No, none at all. But for some time she has been in the employ of this nation's enemies. Rest assured, she will be arrested the moment she leads the police to her co-conspirators. Also, Monsieur Horace Blatt and a day tripper by the name of North have been taken into police custody. What's he done? He was arrested with a considerable quantity of heroin in his possession. Blatt murdered Mrs. Marshall then? No. Fifth columnist? The drug smugglers, as I recall, Mr. Blatt, you thought this a rather dull place for a holiday. And now we must turn our attention to murder. In order to understand the crime, it is necessary to separate the clues to its nature from the many red herrings that obscured our path. Once that is accomplished, we are left with the truth. Let us begin with the comparison of two bottles. The two bottles I compared were, of course... The bottle from the rocky bath and a bottle of trional. While the bottle tossed into the rocky bath is important, it was only necessary to test its contents, not compare it to another. Perfume bottles. I speak of the two perfume bottles. The first bottle was in Madame Marshall's bath. She had applied the perfume before leaving on her float this morning, as I myself remarked. Why would she need a second bottle? And why was it found in the cave? Next, we come to another comparison. And for this, we owe much to the expertise of Mademoiselle Darnley. Three pieces of green fabric. A torn piece of fabric was found near the cave in Cutter's Cove. Another piece of green fabric was found in the fireplace of Linda Marshall. They appeared to be the same fabric as that of Madame Marshall's hat. In fact, Mademoiselle Danny was able to tell at a glance that neither was the silk from the hat. I will now turn to another curious incident of this morning. Someone threw a bottle from the hotel balcony. It narrowly missed Mademoiselle Brewster. Why dispose of an unneeded bottle in such a fashion when there are convenient dustbins? The contents of the bottle was also surprising. Artificial suntan. Testing proved the bottle it had contained artificial suntan. But the weather, it has been most agreeable. The sun, it shines every day. Who would need such a thing? Then there was the contents of Madame Marshall's flask. Trianol. Her coffee was laced with a heavy dose of the sedative trianol. Instead of reviving her, it would almost certainly have put her into a deep sleep. Taken separately, their clues, they mean little. But together, a bath where there should have been none, duplicate perfume bottles, Fabric for the hat that is very much alike, yet not the same. Artificial suntan when the sun it shines brightly. These suggested at once to me a single thought alone. Someone wanted to impersonate Arlena Marshall. Someone wanted to duplicate the hat of Mrs. Marshall. Her deep tan, even her scent. And how can we determine when this impersonation has taken place? It is a sound which gives us the clue. The sound of running water. An odd thing, that running water. It was heard both by Poirot and the maid Gladys Naricot. It was very late in the morning for someone to be taking a bath. And as I observed when I had occasion to use my own bath yesterday at an unusual hour, the sound, it is very noticeable in a quiet hotel. 
Why would someone need to run a bath so late in the morning, if all had already risen and breakfasted? To remove the artificial suntan. To wash off the artificial suntan, perhaps? The bottle, of course, it is thrown into the sea after the suntan is applied, narrowly missing Mademoiselle Brewster. It becomes clear, does it not, that someone impersonated Madame Marshall this very morning, very near to the time of her murder. But why? To provide an alibi for the murderer. Precisement. I have calculated the time it would take for every person on this island to reach Cutter's Cove, murder Madame Marshall, and come away again between 20 of 11 and 15 minutes to 12. And I tell you that only Mademoiselle Darnley can have done it. Monsieur Poirot. Comme vous, Mademoiselle? You were the only one close enough. Yet the nature of the crime, strangulation by powerful hands, eliminates you. Captain Marshall was typing their letters. Linda Marshall and Mrs. Redfern were together at Sanctuary Cove. Monsieur Redfern is in plain sight of several people, both guests and hotel staff. Mrs. Castle tends to her duties. The gardeners were together above the bathing beach, except when Monsieur Gardner goes to fetch the knitting wool. Despite Madame Gardner's apprehensions, he would still not have had enough time to do the deed. Mademoiselle Brewster swims, converses with Poirot and Rose. Monsieur Blatt sails, Major Barry gets lost, Monsieur Lane hikes. What about the tunnels? Ah yes, they're tunnels. They would certainly allow someone to reach Cutter's Cove undetected if their secret were known. But they do not make the trip there any shorter. Whether you travel from the Smuggler's Rest to Cutter's Cove, or the monastery ruins to Cutter's Cove via path or tunnel, the time it is almost the same. And without a compass, you may rest assured the trip would be much longer. The method of murder? Strangulation by a powerful pair of hands. Only a man or a strong woman could have done it. It is true there is a woman in this room who could have done it. Mademoiselle Brewster. Uh, forgive me, Mademoiselle. Not at all. A dancer must keep fit. This fact helps us to eliminate Madame Castle, Madame Gardner, Madame Redfern, Mademoiselle Darnley, and Mademoiselle Linda Marshall as the strangler. Strangulation, yes. A method of murder seen before in Devon. A schoolgirl named Millie Parsons. A housewife named Alice Corrigan. One murdered only a few weeks after the other earlier this year. One of these murders is connected only slightly to the death of Arlena Marshall. But the perpetrator of the other is far more intimately involved. The murderer of Alice Corrigan. Alice Corrigan and Arlena Marshall were murdered by the same man. How does Poirot know this? The unbreakable alibi. The primary suspect in Alice Corrigan's murder also had the unbreakable alibi just as we face here. An alibi based solely on time. Corrigan, the husband of the murdered woman, was apparently aboard a train when she was killed. Yet in that case, all a certain young lady hiker by the name of Elizabeth Stride must do is give the time when she discovers the body at least 20 minutes before Alice Corrigan actually died. The husband has time to alight at the station, kill his wife, and be gone before the police they arrive. Note how the alibi, it is worked precisely the same. And here? Here the clue that demolishes the false alibi in the murder of Arlena Marshall is her stepdaughter's watch. No, Poirot. You're wrong. Linda's watch keeps perfect time. If the watch of Linda Marshall it did not keep their perfect time, I might have forgiven certain testimony as an honest mistake. But there was no honesty about it. It was a deliberate lie. The liar is Christine Redfern. 
You are a liar, Madame Redfern. No. You are the impersonator of Arlena Marshall. And the only way you could have done it is if you changed the time on Linda's watch. You had the opportunity at Sanctuary Cove. You had the opportunity to change it back when you sneaked into her room to add to her fire that cheap green hat you wore as part of your disguise. But how could she change the time on my watch when I was right there at the cove? Mademoiselle, it was easy enough. Turn the watch back 20 minutes the first time you go into the sea. Then ask what time is it as you prepare to go into the sea once more. The watch, it says 15 minutes of 12. But of course, it is in reality only 25 minutes past 11. She is already dressed in the white bathing suit like Arlena's. The green hat, it is concealed in her sketch bag. And the suntan was applied much earlier. Now concealed by the clothes she wears to protect her from the sun. At 11.20... Madame Redfern, she hurries to Cutter's Cove, a journey of no more than 15 minutes. I have timed it myself. She finds Elena unconscious from the drugged coffee and pulls her into the cave. It could not have been easy. She spilled the coffee. Tore her hat? She has but a few moments to dub herself with Elena's perfume and compose herself before the robot with Patrick Redfern at the oars and Emily Brewster in the bow rounds the headland into Cutter's Cove. The time, it is precisely 11.40. You have no proof of any of that. Why would she do such a thing? She loves you, Monsieur Redfern, as you love her. Have I not agreed it is so? Mr. Poirot, you're saying that the woman I saw lying there was Christine Redfern and not Arlena Marshall? Oui bien. A little play artfully contrived for your benefit. Each step you were led, each step you thought you saw what you were supposed to see, then after you left to go get help, And then the real murder occurs. Now, of course, it is truly 15 minutes of 12. Madame Marshall has the time to wash away the artificial tan, change his clothes, and arrive for her tennis rendezvous. Monsieur Poirot, I am sure everyone will agree that I might have had a motive to kill Arlena, but not Patrick. You think I believe in your jealousy, mademoiselle? When your husband, if he is indeed your husband, 
loves you and you know it to be true? No. The true motive lies in two documents. Letter from Arlena's solicitors. A telegram reveals that a sizable portion of her fortune was paid out last week to her. Ten thousand pounds to be exact. Do you know anything of this, Captain Musher? First I've heard of it. Letter from J.N. A letter from a former admirer named Jimmy Nash gives us an insight into Mrs. Marshall and her relationships with a certain kind of man. It is clear that he has requested and received money from her sometime in the past. I said to Captain Marshall earlier today that until we can comprehend fully and completely exactly what kind of a person Alina Marshall was, we shall not be able to see clearly exactly the kind of person who murdered her. And what do we see from these two letters? Alena was taken advantage of by men she was attracted to. Arlena Marshall was a woman who needed to be admired, adored, it is true. But what was the result? She was fair game for a certain type of man who takes advantage of such women. Just as Jimmy Nash convinced her to give him money, Patrick Redfern did the same. And I know as surely as I know anything, that before Jimmy Nash, there was another such man, and before him, another. Arlena was not the predator. She was the victim. That was her character. And that is the character of Edward Corrigan, the man who killed her, just as he killed his wife Alice for her inheritance only a few months ago. No proof whatsoever. Not a shred that will hold up in court. Oh, I don't know about that. Here's something even Perot hasn't heard yet. Although knowing him, he expects it. I sent a photograph of the two of you he borrowed from your suitcase to the Brixham police. Allow me to make this small deduction, Colonel. They have identified you as Edward Corrigan and Elizabeth Stride, the young woman who found the body. Oh, well that's torn it. Edward, don't be a fool! Say, that looks like my revolver. You can go quietly to the noose if you like, my dear. I have other plans. Poirot? Shouldn't we chase after him? Poirot does not chase. Damned, interfering, lousy little worm. One step and I'll kill you. 
I may do it anyway. Here is your chance, Hastings. Warn him if you wish to. Try not to get Waro killed, please. Do not signal with the lantern. And why not? I told young Monsieur Jenks the lie. What has Jenks got to do with it? That is Madame Castle's signal lantern you stole from her safe that she used to signal the U-Boats. I too found the lantern and also the codebook. I told Monsieur Jinx that three long flashes of the light is safe, but it is the code to fire at the signal. I expected you to try and block my escape, but I'm no fool. You're bluffing. It is no bluff. Sorry, you greasy little foreigner, but I just don't believe you. Very well, Hastings. We can go now. Achtung! Stellen Sie Koordinaten ein! Bereit! One mystery only remains, Hastings. You have the clue. Code. What is then the code that allows someone to control their finger of suspicion? When you think you have the answer, tell me and we shall see what we shall see.
Bravo, Hastings. That is indeed the code that unlocks their finger of suspicion. You have uncovered the secret of its magic. The case, it is now complete, my friend. You have walked in Poirot's shoes. Poirot, I'll be honest with you. Now that I've given it a try, your job is not as easy as I thought. But thank you for the experience. I am proud to be your friend. And I am honored to have you as mine, Hastings. We have passed the hours most agreeably. Yes, I thank you for that too. I'm sorry, old chap. I should trot on over to the war office, I'm afraid. And so, one mystery solved, and another, even greater, begins. Don't you worry. No more holidays at the beach for a time, maybe. But we'll pull through. You'll see. Oh, I feel like the dinosaur, Hastings. Gone is my world, where good always triumphs over evil. Where the clues, they all add up to the satisfactory solution where the murderer never escapes. This will be war as we have never seen it. Whatever the outcome, mon ami, the cost, it will be high. And I fear our world, it will never be the same.